Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K-E-S-H-W-A-N-I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single one of these problems. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to these problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 184. Please start to it. Page number 184, problem number 220. Let's see what it has to say. The very first problem on the page, page number 184 as I said. Number 220 says Number 220 says 2 over 1 plus 2 over y, we are told, equals 1. Now listen, we can, we can solve this problem in more of a traditional way, in a very classical way, or we can do it in a more straightforward way. The most straightforward way to realize, is most, most straightforward way is to realize that since it's 2 over some quantity, 2 over some quantity we are, to equals, we are told is 1, then this quantity, whatever, has, uh, whatever this is, also has to be 2 because 2 over 2, 2 over 2 equals 1. So this quantity has to equal 2. 1 plus 2 over y has to equal 2. Subtract 1 from both sides. If you subtract 1 from both sides, we end up with 2 over y equals 1. That's it, we're done. Cross multiply both sides by y and y equals 2. That's it. We're done. Y equals 2, which makes perfect sense because if you put Y equal to 2 in this thing, you'll end up with 2 over 2, which is 1, 2 over 2 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, and 2 over 2 is 1. There you go. That's all. Well, like I said, if you wanted to, you could do it in a more traditional way, which is a very classical, very orthodox, very geeky way, which, which is to go through the entire process. And if you like, we can actually do it that, that, way, as well, uh, that way as well, but it's not necessary. It's a waste of time, actually, to do it in a more traditional way, but if you like, you can do it that way as well, which is to find the common denominator, you'll find 2 over y plus 2 over y equals 1. Bring the y on, on the top, so we end up with 2y over y plus 2 equals 1, which is same as which is same as 2y equals 2y plus 2. Let's continue this on the top here. So we end up with 2y equals y plus 2. Subtract y from both sides, and we end up with y equals to 2. But either way, it's not a big deal, really. It's a very straightforward problem. Let's do the, let's do the next one. Two hundred and twenty-one. Two hundred and twenty-one. In two hundred and twenty-one, we are told that a. B and C are consecutive positive integers such that A is less than B which is less than C. And the question is which must which of the following must be true. It's important that we understand the significance of the words, we are not asking which of the following could be true or which of the following may be true. The word that is used here, the condition here is which of the following must be true. We are looking for a statement, there are three statements there, we are looking for all the statements, statements that are of such nature that they have to be true all the time and not at some, not for some number, not for the others. Let's look at first one. The first one says C minus A equals 2. C minus A equals 2. Let's see if that's true. There are, there are two ways we can go about it. One way actually is to, is to do it algebraically, tradition, algebraically in a classical way, in an orthodox way, and the other one is to plug in numbers. Again, either way is fine, either way is straightforward. If you look at, if you plug in numbers here, such that A is less than B, which is less than C, contemplate two scenarios, they have to be positive and they have to be whole number obviously, but contemplate two scenarios where you start out first time odd numbers, 3, 4, 5, and just to make sure that you cover all your bases, start out with even number, 4, 5, 6. But as you can see, whether it's 3, 4, 5, because of the fact that they're consecutive, 
because of the fact that I can take as if a is less than b, which is less than c, what's going on is this, a is less than b, which is less than c, if this is a, b, because of the fact that they are consecutive, consecutive means they come right after the other. So if this is a, then b would have to be a plus 1. It has to be one more than a. And c would have to be a plus 2. c is one more than b, b is one more than a. And therefore, c minus a, c minus a, as you can see, c is a plus 2, minus a, a drops out and the difference between the two is 2. As you can see, this drops out and the difference between A and C will always be 2. The difference between, between, between the first number and the last number will always be 2 because there are three consecutive numbers. Three consecutive numbers which means the second one is one more than the first one and the, sec and the third one is two more than the first one. Therefore, the third one minus the first one, the difference is always 2. It doesn't matter whether you start out with even number or odd number, the difference will always be 2. This statement, this statement is such that it is something that has to be true all the time, which, was, which is what the question was asking, which of the following must be true. And it is of a nature where it must be true, it has to be true. Therefore, now we know that the correct answer, whatever it is, must contain Roman numeral 1 in it. Don't waste your time. These are called 1, 2, 3 problems. Roman numeral 1, 2, 3 problems. They give you three statements. When you see a problem like this, first of all, don't waste your time trying to work through the all three of the statements together, one after the other, and then look for the right combination. Also, when you have a 1, 2, 3 problem, there is no reason, there is no need, there is no law which says that you must go in that sequence. If you find one of those three statements to be more difficult, if you find that one statement is giving you a little bit trouble, skip it. Skip the damn thing. Just move on to the next one and look for the right combination. Just now we, just now we established that the first statement actually is something that must be true. Now, reason we started with the first statement because it's very straightforward. Had the first statement given me trouble, I would have skipped it. Let's look at the answer choices. Let's look at the answer choices. A, B, C, D, and E. It says one only. We just found out that one works. So that is a pot potential possibility. Second statement says two only. Second statement says two only. Answer choice B says two only. That is not a right answer. We know now that the first statement works, which means any answer choice that does not have Roman numeral one cannot be the right answer. C says one and two. C says one and two. So that's the pot pot potential possibility. D says 2 and 3, 2 and 3, that is not a possibility, we need 1 in it, 1 has to be in there, and E says all 3, all 3, so that's a possibility, so as it stands right now, the answer could be A, C, or E, we do not know yet, but we do know for a fact that the correct answer, whatever it is, cannot be B, cannot, cannot be B, cannot be D, because it doesn't have a number of 1 in it, let's look at second statement. The second statement says that second statement says that a times b times c is even. Again, we can either do it with algebraically, or we can, uh, or we can, uh, or we can uh, use numbers. It's up to you. Again, it's not a, it's not it's not a big deal. If we use numbers, we'll find three four three times four times five. It doesn't, it doesn't matter the fact that we have two odd numbers. It doesn't matter how many odd numbers you have when you multiply a whole bunch of numbers. When you multiply a whole bunch of numbers, let, let's say you got 20,000 numbers there, 20,001 number, let's say, and out of those 20,001 number, and you take a product of those 20,001 number, out of those 20,001 number, if there are 20,000 of them that are odd, odd times odd is odd, 3 times 5 is 15, which is odd. But as long as at least one of those number has to be even, as long as one of those 20,001 number happens to be even, the fact that the other 20,000 are odd, it doesn't matter. As long as at least one of them is even, the product will always be even. So here, odd times odd is odd, but odd times even is even. So this will always be even. Similarly, if we started out with sort of, sort of an odd number, if we started out with 4, this is where the story ends. It doesn't matter what these two numbers are. Here, this is an even number. So even times the product of these two, whether it's odd or even, it doesn't matter. The even times odd is even, and even times even is even. So this will always be even. The second statement is also true. Now, another way, another way to actually analyze, another way to actually analyze this statement is exactly what we just did here. Inadvertently, ended up doing it, which is to actually start out like that. Pretend that a is even. Now, if a is even, if a is even because of the fact that they're consecutive. If a happens to be even, let's say 4, the next one will be 5, which is odd. 
and then the one after that is going to be even. Again, it doesn't matter. We don't want to analyze the whole thing. We have a whole bunch of number. At least one of them has to be even. At least one of them has to be even. As long as at least one of them is even, the product is going to be even. So that is true. If we started out with R, let's say 3, the next one will be 4. Well, that is even. This is where the story ends. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the last one is. As long as at least one of the numbers is even in the product of a whole bunch of numbers, the product will be even. Second statement is also of such a nature that it must be true. It has to be true all the time. Let's see what we can cross out. At this point, I'm going to change color so we can see it easily. Anything that does not have Roman numeral 2 in it, anything that does not have Roman numeral 2 in it, we can cross out. This one has 2 in it, so this one has to stay. This one has 2 in it, this one has to stay. And this one says all 3, that one has to stay. Turns out we cannot get rid of anything. We cannot get rid of anything. Let's look at the third statement. Let's look at the third statement. The third statement says that if you divide, if you take their average, it will be an integer. A plus B plus C, we are told, is an integer. A plus B plus C divided by 3. Again, we can look at it, we can look at it algebraically, we can analyze it algebraically, or we can plug in numbers. Either way is fine. Let's do it both ways very quickly. A is just A. B we know is going to be A plus 1, because there's one more than that, so it's A plus 1. And C we know is A plus 2. It's 2 more than A. A plus 2 divided by 3. And what do you suppose we will get when we add them up? We get A plus A plus A, we get 3A. And then 1 plus 2, which is 3, over 3. We see 3 common. 3 is the common factor, so we can take it out common. And what we end up is a plus 1 over 3. 3 is going to drop out. And of course, a plus 1 is an integer. a plus 1 is an integer because that's b. But we don't have to do any of this thing. What we have to realize here, all we need to realize here, I'm showing you a lot more work than is, absolute, than is necessary here. A real exam, you have to think in a quick ma manner. We have three consecutive numbers. It does not matter what the three consecutive numbers are. This quantity represents their average. And how do you find the average of three consecutive numbers? Or as a matter of fact, how do you find the average of any evenly spaced number? They don't even have to be consecutive. If, this, if I have three consecutive numbers here, 7, 8, and 9, this quantity A plus B plus C divided by 3 represents their average. And their average is right here, the guy in the middle. Of course it's an integer. The question is, is this quantity, question is, is this quantity an integer? And the answer is, of course it's an integer, it's the bloody middle one. It's the bloody middle one. And like I said, here, they happen to be consecutive numbers, but they didn't, they didn't even need to be consecutive numbers, as long as they are evenly spaced. As long as they are evenly spaced. If, if, we, had, if, if we had, let's say, seven, uh, if we had 77, 87, and 97, that's not 87, is it? If we had 77, or the, if we had 77, 87, and 97, as we can, as we can clearly see, they are no longer conse consecutive integers, but they are evenly spaced. As long as they are evenly spaced, as long as their difference is always constant, the average is going to be the middle number. And since all of them are integers, then obviously the middle number is integer. That's what this is. So the third statement tells us that their average is integer. Their average is going to be an integer, which of course is true because their average is the middle guy, which is an integer. Turns out that the third statement is also of such a nature that it must be true. The answer turns out to be E. The answer to this problem is E, all three, and not not D, and not C. Oh, D was already gone. I'm not thinking straight. The answer is E. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye now.